The story I'd like to share with you today is one of the world's most extraordinary and improbable tales of business success. It's about a man who was born in a fishing village in rural India. He became the richest man in India. His son became the richest person on earth in 2007. How did this happen? This story is an excerpt from my book, Wealth Secrets, How the Rich Got Rich, now out in paperback. Like all the stories in the book, it's not just a biography. It's a story of how he did it. What factors made it possible for this unlikely man to become one of the world's billionaires? Like many great stories, Durbai Ambani's life has also been made into a movie. It's called Guru. It's a Bollywood song and dance number, but even if that's not your thing, I highly recommend it. It's a great movie, really well acted. And I'll use some stills from the movie to illustrate some key points of Durbai's life. So beginning at the beginning, Durbai Ambani was born in Churvad, India in 1932. Even today, it's kind of a backwater. This is a photo I took there a couple of years ago. A big occupation for people is subsistence fishing. You can see this line of fishing boats out on the horizon. There was an attempt to turn it into a tourist resort, but uh, here, this is uh, the beach at Chorvad. As you can see, the attempt did not go so well. Even today, Chorvad is the kind of place where if you have something you want to get from point A to point B, hooking a camel to a cart is a pretty common way to go about it. The gentleman on the motorcycle here on the main street is turning down the street to the beach. If you go back towards the camera, you get uh, onto the street that goes to Durabai's house. Here it is, the house where Durabai Ambani was born and grew up. Now, it's, it looks like an impressive house, quite a gateway there, but the, it's actually an apartment building. The Ambani family only had two rooms in the house. On the lower left-hand corner, you can see one window is open. That's one of the rooms that the family uh, rented. Here it is from the inside. This is the living room. It's more or less as it would have been when Durabai was growing up in the 1930s. Now the house, because of his great success, the house has become a museum. When it came time for Durabai to go to high school, he left for the big city, Junagadh. Here it is. This is the, uh, one of the entrance gates to the city. It would have been pretty unusual for anyone in Durabai's village to go to high school, but Durabai's father was a school teacher and placed a high value on education. This is the city center of Junagadh. It's a little bit unusual to see tourists there, so people would sometimes come up to me and um, strike up a conversation, and they would always say, hey, did you know that this is the place where Durabai Ambani went to high school? A local boy made good. This is Durabai's high school. It's still a high school today. In Durabai's day, it was painted green, but otherwise looks more or less the same. When Durbai graduated from school, he decided he wouldn't be able to get a good job in India, and so he decided to go to Yemen. Uh, here in this still from the movie, he's going to Turkey, but in actuality it was Yemen. Yemen was still a British colony at the time, and so a young man who spoke reasonably good English could expect to get a pretty well-paid job there. When Durabai had saved up enough money, he came back to India, started up a trading company, Trading Yarn. Uh, he loved it. He was good at it. Uh, he made a bit of money, but he didn't really start to make money until he moved into trading government licenses. And this was a bit unusual, even in India. 
And um, that's where Durabai started to become exceptional. Although I don't think he realized it at the time. I don't think anyone else realized it at the time. The licenses were licenses to import synthetic fabrics like uh, polyester or rayon, really in demand at the time, but heavily restricted by the Indian government. It was also illegal, or at least a gray area, and the government kept on shutting down the trade in licenses. Uh, when it was shut down, Durbai would leap to the defense. Here, here's a uh, still from the movie where Durbai is delivering a bunch of rayon and polyester that he can't get licenses for to a very surprised government minister's house. The government minister then will reopen the um, market. In actuality, a bit more complicated than this. There was a long legal battle, but the point is Durbai always leapt to the market's defense and managed to get it reopened whenever it was shut down. Now, if you are not an Indian business person of a certain age, you may be listening to this story and thinking, what the heck is going on here? But the thing you have to understand is that Indian businesses in the 1950s and 1960s especially were hugely regulated by a regime of government licensing. You needed a license to import, you needed a license to export, you needed a license to build a factory, you needed a license to produce, the license told you how much you could produce. It was kind of a nightmare. I describe it in the book as follows. Trying to make a profit in Indian business was perhaps a bit like being a rat stuck in a maze designed by sadistic research scientists. If, against the odds, you ran the maze and reached the cheese, there was no cheese. Or maybe there was cheese, a marvelous cheese, but it was on the other side of a glass wall and sitting there on the other side of the wall, watching you and probably nibbling your cheese, were a bunch of Indian bureaucrats giggling. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds like a nightmare, and it was, but some people somehow managed to prosper. One example is this man seated here, G.D. Birla, with his son, Aditya Birla, behind him. How did he do it? Well, Birla was a great friend and supporter of the Indian independence leader, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, now, Gandhi was assassinated soon after India became independent, but Birla was still reasonably friendly uh, with the new leaders of the Congress party, which took power after India became independent. And it soon became clear that if the Congress party was going to stay in power, it was going to need to win elections, and Indian elections were going to be pretty expensive. Uh, the party had to field about 4,000 candidates for every election simply because India was so huge. So they needed money to fund the campaigns. And Birla volunteered, stepped up, gave about $5 million to the campaign. Uh, Tata, another very large business house, which had uh, operated a steel monopoly under the British, they gave about $5 million to the campaign as well. It wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was enough to help the Congress party win the next election handily. And then what you might expect would happen, happened. <laughs> um, now, it's possible to be too cynical about this. Keep in mind, uh, the Birlas and the Tatas had a great track record in business at that point. Uh, but what happened was that the government began to award licenses for production, investment, etc., etc., and the Birlas and Tatas began to get rather a lot of these licenses. Indeed, in the five years after the election, the Birlas got licenses amounting to about one-fifth of all business investment in the entire Indian economy in those years. Uh, the Tatas did well over the next um, 30 years or so. Their business uh, grew about 25 times by assets. Uh, Birla's business did, did even better. It grew by about uh, 40 times. Uh, to this day, uh, the Birla's really like to remind you about their friendship with Gandhi in pretty much any Indian airport. You can see a store like this one funded by the Aditya Birla group that sells Gandhi tchotchkes. Now, the things that they were doing to make all this money were not 
all that challenging. One example is they were making this ambassador motor car. It was still generating profits for the group up to the 1990s, and it was a terrible car. It was essentially copied from a 1960s Morris ambassador car from the UK. I had this distinct pleasure of riding one in the 1990s, and it, you know, the radiator, the, the radiator didn't really work, so the dashboard would heat up and you couldn't touch it. <laughs> I mean, it was a terrible, the Indian roads are terrible too. It was a 10 hour drive. Now, the thing is, the Birlas and the Tatas claimed to hate the licensing regime. Birla said it's a Damocles sword hanging over you. You know, you never know what's going to happen. You might have a license withdrawn. Tata was even more extreme. Here's, um, here's a passage from the book. The retired Indian industrialist and respected author Gertran Das recalled a meeting he once had with J.R.D. Tata, patriarch of the Tata clan. Das called on Tata at his home, the Cairn, an island of green in Mumbai's concrete jungle. To reach Tata's personal office, Das walked down a long and winding corridor past a number of public rooms, each filled with flowers. I am powerless, Tata said during their interview. I cannot decide how much to borrow, what shares to issue, at what price, what wages or bonus to pay, and what dividend to give. It was the late 1960s. Parliament was about to pass a law restricting the largest business houses still further. Henceforth, I will not be allowed to start a new business or even expand an older one. What do they expect me to do? Sit here and die, I suppose, said Tata, his face filled with sadness. Now, it's hard to take such criticism at face value considering how well the Tatas and Birlas did. But keep in mind, they probably felt this way about the system. The Tatas, for instance, had almost a hundred licenses rejected by the government. What they didn't realize was that this system of licensing was what was helping them prosper by restricting any competitors, especially any small competitors without political connections, still further. In other words, they were making all this money whenever the government allowed them to, because no one else was allowed to come and compete with them. Now, they may not have realized this, but one man did realize it, and that was Dhirubhai Ambani. And what Dhirubhai Ambani realized was that the reason Birla could make money making crappy cars was because the sector was so heavily licensed. You couldn't import any other cars, you couldn't make any other cars, and therefore you could make a ton of money making a crappy car. Something very simple to do from a business perspective. And so Ambani decided to do something completely crazy. He went into the textiles sector. Now... Textiles was the most highly regulated sector of all the Indian economy because the Indian government was terrified about putting the small scale weaving hand loom cotton producers in India, which made a giant part of Indian employment. Uh, it was absolutely terrified about putting them out of business and so really refused to license any kind of large scale production in textiles. And most people would stay away from this sector like, uh, you know, we wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. I mean, it, 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 that's the sector, the last sector most people would go into. But Durbai understood the potential. He understood that like Birla making these cars, if he could be one of the only people licensed in the sector, he would be much better off than if he was going into a much easier sector where a ton of people could come and compete with him. And so he started first a textile mill and then a factory making polyester yarn. Here it is in, in the movie. It's called Shakti Polyester. In, in actuality, it was called Reliance Industries. Now, even starting this thing up was a huge challenge. There were some 400 applicants for the license to build a polyester factory. That gives you some idea of the potential competition. It went down to a short list of about 40, and then from there, only two 
were finally awarded licenses, including Dirabai's Reliance Industries. How did he do it? Well, in the movie, no one really knows. In the movie, he uh, bribes the prime minister. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not quite clear. The, the minister he's talking to never shows his face. You only see the back of his head. But, um, but it's sort of alluded uh, pretty strongly that that's what's going on. Um, that, that that's how this man who came from nowhere via Yemen ended up with one of these amazing licenses. And when I say amazing licenses, okay, think of it this way, you know, it's summer in New York City and the government allows only two ice cream shops in the entirety of New York City, right? That's the position you're in, right? <laughs> it's a pretty good position. And the thing about Durbay was he was totally upfront about what was going on. You know, unlike other people who maybe didn't quite understand it, he not only understood it, he was willing to say exactly what was happening. Here's what he said. There were occasions when we exported rayon at a loss because the entire purpose was to get an import license for nylon, Dirabai later explained. Because the licensing scheme had artificially inflated the price of nylon, the markup on imported nylon was typically about 300%, occasionally as high as 700%, which is a, that's a crazy level of profitability. In this country, it is considered fashionable to complain about government restrictions, said Durabai. We took the restrictions as an opportunity. If the rules against nylon imports had not been there, I could not have made the money. So yes, you know, Durabai had some great slogans for his brands. Here's Vimal. Vimal was one of his first brands. Um, but but he knew what was going on. It wasn't the slogans. It wasn't just the marketing. It was the restraints on competition. The business was profitable pretty much from day one. By 1980, he was making about $60 million in profit. By uh, the mid-1980s, he's making $300 million in profit. And he was one of the five largest businesses in India. By the 1990s, he was the largest business in India. Now, I don't want to give you the idea that he was just bribing people to make this happen. Rather, he understood how the system worked and he was able to make the system work for him. For instance, uh, he would go to the government bureaucracy and he would explain to them, look, look, this is an economies of scale business. The larger the factory is the more efficient it is. So you don't want to award a lot of licenses to a lot of inefficient small factories, just award one license to me, you know. So to do this, he said, he said the, the most important external environment for business is the government of India, direct quote. And he would go, you know, he, he said he's willing, I am willing to salam to anyone. All, selling the idea is the most important thing. And for that, I'll meet anybody in government. So he was selling this kind of way of doing business. He wasn't just bribing people. He was selling this way of doing business and it worked astonishingly well. Here's his uh, house in Mumbai. Uh, you know, the gate, the front gate doesn't look like much, but then you look up and it's a personal skyscraper, 17 stories tall, uh, a helipad on top that was added later. Um, it, there were some Hel Beverly Hillbillies moments when he moved in. Uh, some of the neighbors complained that uh, goats were being kept in the backyard, but it, undeniably a tremendous rags to riches success story. Uh, you know, sometimes now Durbai is looked on unfavorably, uh, you know, people see him as corrupt, but really what he was, was able to understand the system better than anyone else and, and understand how that system works to limit competition, how that system works to enable him to make money. He also had a great public shield in the form of his shareholders. He cultivated a great mass. Here was, this was one of the largest shareholder meetings. It was actually the largest shareholder meeting in history at the time that it occurred, uh, held in the Mumbai Cooperage football grounds. 
and uh, he made a generation of Indian middle class people rich by handing out shares in Reliance and then doing staggeringly well, thanks in large part to these government restrictions, eventually moving on into industries uh, all the way up into oil refining. When Durabai died in 2002, uh, he passed the business on to his sons, Mukesh and Anil, uh, on the left, uh, Mukesh and on the right. First, they had a little war over who would control it, but they eventually settled it and really uh, have carried on the family tradition, admittedly in a somewhat difficult uh, and different uh, business environment where they, they've had to face more competition and come up with some very creative approaches and bold approaches to attempting to see off that competition. They also carried on the tradition in terms of family dwellings. This is Mukesh's house in Mumbai, 27 stories tall, uh, includes three helipads. His, hers, and uh, company. Here it is at night. Um, people say at night it's capped with a lidless eye of flame. <laughs> just, just joking. Just joking about that. But it definitely uh, stands out in the uh, Mumbai skyline. So what can we learn from Durabai's story? Well, Durabai was obviously very clever, very gutsy, very hardworking, but so are lots of other people. What makes this story so unusual when you hear it is that it's such a bizarre place to do business, such a bizarre way of doing business in this highly regulated, highly licensed sector. And that's no coincidence. What makes this story different is what makes Dhirubhai so exceptional in his success. It was that this sector was so odd in facing almost no competition. And that is the key takeaway of what of Dhirubhai Ambani's story and Dhirubhai Ambani's life. And then what I do in the book is I show how this kind of approach to avoiding competition or finding places where there are no competition is something that is then applied much more widely in lots of other much more normal sectors like the tech sector today or banking sector today or going back to the robber barons of US history even back to ancient Rome how does this apply because that is ultimately uh, the Dhirubhai Ambani uh, success story and what Dhirubhai Ambani teaches you is that you know, absence of competition is what gives you that private island, lays you that golden egg, gets you that personal skyscraper.